This topic is very unusual, but it's something I've been speaking about for two years. And to any group, to any lecture, to any class that I teach, I talk about the opioid epidemic. So if it's a church group or a real estate group or principles of macroeconomics, I always give a little introduction to this issue. And this is the first time I've really talked about it at length. It's the first time this lecture has been given at Mises University. And I think it's important for the fact that it's a matter of life and death. And it's a matter of a short-term, immediate-term problem. And it's a problem that now faces all Americans. And indeed, a lot of people around the world, in European countries, this is also uh, having a big impact. And so the best view, I think, of the opioid epidemic, we'll start off with some statistics to give you some flavor for uh, what this epidemic has become. Okay, so in this chart, it shows the overdose deaths from opioid use from 2000 to 2015. Okay, and obviously if we add up all the opioids, the number is quite substantial. We're talking in far in excess of 30,000 Americans dying each year from this. Um, back when I did my dissertation at Auburn University on the economics of prohibition, the number of deaths from opioids was just a couple of thousand people. So the numbers have increased dramatically and the impact is spreading widely. And so when you look at the overall opioid deaths, that is a combination of prescription opiates, Oxycontin, Vicodin, things like that, things that are routinely prescribed by doctors. And then heroin and synthetic opioids, particularly fentanyl, which you've probably all heard of. It was involved with the death of Michael Jackson, Prince, uh, uh, what's his name, Seymour Hoffman. What's his first name? Philip Seymour Hoffman and a lot of other celebrities, but also a lot of everyday ordinary Americans. So the numbers are quite staggering, and the number for 2016 uh, is expected, once it finally comes in, to be far in excess of the figure in 2015. Um, but before we get into this in detail, I want to just mention to you the pain e epidemic in the United States. In 2003, there was a study of European countries, and uh, the number here is that 10 to 55 percent of adult Europeans suffer from chronic pain. That's a staggering number. Uh, the fact that it looked at 13 different reports means that they're measuring pain differently and they're measuring populations differently. So it's, it's not a hard and fast number, but uh, it is indicative of what we're facing. A 2006 study uh, similarly looked at European countries and found that the average amount of chronic pain was 20% of adults. 2011, a study found that 116 million Americans suffered from chronic pain. And this is really staggering. When I was a child, a teenager, it, chronic pain was not much of a major issue. And there's no studies recently, but what I did was I looked at the number of Google hits for chronic pain in 2011, 2012, 2013, and so on, and I found that the number of uh, hits for chronic pain in 2011 jumped, doubled in 2016, from 13 million hits in 2011 to 26 million hits in 2016. So far in 2017, we've exceeded the 26 million hits on Google. So this is something that is kind of exploding, but off the radar map. And I have no answer for the idea of what's causing all this chronic pain, 
but it's something that is very unusual. Opioid prescriptions. This is data from 2012. Um, the yellow states, uh, there were 52 to 71 prescriptions written for 100, for every 100 people. That's an enormous amount. Even if an individual is only is responsible for 12 monthly prescriptions, it's a huge figure. Uh, the dark states in the center of the country, the number of prescriptions written for opioids for per 100 people was 96 to 143. I saw a report earlier this year that the state of Alabama uh, last year was 149 prescriptions written for every 100 individuals. So there's a lot of pain out there and there's a lot of opioids being prescribed and there's a lot of people dying from that. Fentanyl, which I mentioned earlier, it's a synthetic opioid. Um, the number of mentions in law enforcement circles for fentanyl, usually in overdose uh, situations, was very, very small, just a matter of a few hundred uh, prior to 2010. And then in 2013, we saw the number jump tremendously, and uh, it is widely known now that a lot of fentanyl is being illegally imported into the United States by China, by pharmaceutical and chem chemical companies in China. The face of the heroin addiction problem has changed dramatically. In the 1960s, when the heroin problem first emerged in the United States, became public notice, uh, the face or the image of the heroin addict was that of the inner city urban junkie uh, or Vietnam vets who took up the habit fighting the Vietnam War and brought it back. And when, that's when we saw an explosion of heroin addiction in the United States. So in the early years, it was mostly inner city minority, minorities and Vietnam vets. Later, that has changed so that older African-American men is a big group, uh, more suburban use, uh, but the statistics are still dominated by young minority men. Today, the fastest growing component of this problem is quite unlike what it has been historically. Now the problem has moved out into rural areas, to places like uh, little cities that are coal mining cities or fishing villages in Maine, uh, very unusual places and locations for the heroin epidemic to sort of explode in unusual ways. As you saw, the opioid prescriptions were heavily concentrated in the central part of the United States. So what's the cause? Well, if you read the media about this epidemic, they'll trot out the usual suspects. The suppliers on the supply side, the drug dealers, the smugglers, the cocaine cartels, and all that, that they're responsible for it and that we need to squash the supply side of this market. There's also the demand side. It's these drug addicts. It's the addictive uh, capacity of these drugs that is responsible for the problem. Of course, we have the gateway theory of drugs, which is important to know about, which suggests that if you try marijuana, you're ultimately going to end up dying from a heroin overdose. Now, this theory has been completely debunked by about four or five different disciplines that there's no physiological reason why you'd suspect that marijuana use would lead to heroin overdose. There's no sociological reason that marijuana use would lead to heroin addiction. Um, there's no chemical reason. Um, there's, real, there's really not an economic reason why in a free market, marijuana consumption would lead to heroin um, use and addiction and so forth. Um, so the gateway theory has been completely debunked, although it's still um, 
very popular in the media, uh, crack babies, totally debunked just recently on Mises.org, um, is totally a fabricated story in order to sell copies. Um, but nonetheless, law enforcement, criminal justice, the media, they all point to this gateway theory as a way of explaining away the problem. Of course, the free market is blamed. Even though the free market isn't in play here, experts will, uh, you know, just say, oh, well, it's the free market's fault, just like they do on so many other occasions. They don't have a real explanation, so they resort to these types of explanation. Uh, China and our enemies, the, the evil, you know, Central American dictators and Chinese and so on and so forth, they're responsible for the problem. They're the ones that are bringing in, in particular, the fentanyl. And because the media tends to sell this story, most people, if they hear these types of ex explanations, will accept those types of explanations. And as a result, they argue for yet more prohibition, more penalties, more law enforcement, more snooping, more power to the DEA, and so forth. And of course, uh, drug or addiction uh, treatment programs, uh, other types of government intervention. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who used to be our U.S. Senator, is trying to revive this war on drugs. He's trotting out uh, the, the old drug awareness programs and so on and so forth, which have already been proven. Uh, DARE, what's DARE? Drug awareness, whatever, the, the program for schools. The studies of that program found that the program actually encouraged students to try drugs. <laughs> and yet, it's still thought of as a way to solve the problem. Now, the real reasons, I'll just list them here, and then we'll come back and uh, flesh them out a little bit. And I'm hoping to leave plenty of time here uh, for questions and answers, uh, because this is a topic that is not talked about and written about in a scientific way, so I would really appreciate all of your input into this discussion as well. Okay, opioids opiates, uh, they are dangerous. They are addictive. There is a reason to be very cautious and to avoid these things if at all possible, even the prescription versions. The prescription versions on their own kill a lot of people. Government inter intervention in the economy is also very important. A major source of drug addiction is government intervention in the economy, most notably war. So a lot of people became, the first American addicts were veterans of the American Civil War. For example, they had injuries, they had amputations, they had real pain, um, and not to mention the horrors of war that they uh, suffered through. Uh, you can imagine going into battle back then with everybody your age from your county back home, whether you were north or south, and in a particular battle, you may be the only one out of a hundred who survives intact as a result. Um, but government intervention in the economy, uh, you'll learn this in some of your other classes, every time government creates a monopoly position in the economy, no matter if it's for doctors or lawyers, uh, it doesn't really matter. They're creating monopolies all over the place, right? Most industries in the U.S. have some kind of monopoly power built into the structure of their industry. That means there's fewer of them, and that means people who otherwise would have been in those industries producing goods and services in the economy, they don't have a place in that industry. That means that they have to go to a less desirable occupation, a less desirable space in the economy. And as they go into those spaces which are don't have monopoly power, wages and returns in those industries are depressed, they're decreased. 
And so there's a natural part of our economy um, due to government intervention where the returns and the wages and the incomes are artificially suppressed due to government intervention. And then there's the iron, the iron law of prohibition. The iron law of prohibition, which we'll, we'll get more to, um, is basically whenever you prohibit something such as drugs and alcohol, you make them more potent and more dangerous. Okay, so that's a very real reason why this is a very big problem. But most importantly, what's causing the epidemic today is that drug companies and the American Medical Association have changed the prescription guidelines for pain medication. So only in the last few years has it typically been the case that normal, average, ordinary people who go into the, to the doctor's office for a medical problem, they're routinely prescribed opiates such as Oxycontin and Vicodin, whereas 10 years ago, they wouldn't have been prescribed addictive opiates. They would have been prescribed ordinary painkillers like prescription strength Motrin, for example. I had a, um, a minor medical problem about 10 years ago. I went into the doctor and they prescribed me prescription strength Motrin. Not a, not a problem. About five years ago, I went into a different doctor's um, office, uh, a, a doc in the box type thing, and I was seen by a physician's assistant. And uh, I wasn't surprised by the fact that they wrote me a prescription uh, they called it into the pharmacy. I picked it up on my way home, and when I got home, I took one of them, and about 30 minutes later, I was getting kind of woozy, and I stood up, and I almost fell over. And as soon as I studied, studied myself, I went into the bathroom and looked at the prescription, and it was Oxycontin. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. So the guidelines for prescribing pain medication have been changed so that an enormous number of people now are routinely given prescriptions for opiates instead of normal painkillers. Okay, so the first one, heroin is addictive and heroin is dangerous. Basically, heroin is a form of morphine and... Uh, in terms of reducing pain, it also suppresses your metabolism. And if you take too much of it, it'll basically uh, make you fall asleep and stop breathing and die. It was introduced in the market by the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company in 1898 or 97. Uh, it was marketed as a non-addictive substitute for morphine. A little bit of misleading advertising. Of course, they didn't really do all the testing like we do today um, back then, uh, so they really didn't know, but it was very effective product, uh, particularly for lung-related problems, bronchitis and things like that where you're constantly coughing. Um, so it was marketed by Bayer from 1898 to 1910, uh, Bayer uh, it realized that the evidence was building up that people were becoming addicted to this uh, new product, and uh, so they took it off the market in 1910, and they um, introduced during that period an alternative painkiller called aspirin, which is still not completely harmless, but not a, it's not addictive. Um, and doesn't have uh, nearly the medical consequences of an opiate. And then shortly thereafter, in 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act came into play and made heroin, morphine, cocaine, um, and a variety of other drugs and similar substitutes illegal. So that's, that sets in motion 
uh, the economics of prohibition. Second reason that I've mentioned is government intervention in the economy. Uh, war is a big cause. I mentioned the Civil War. I also mentioned the fact that Vietnam vets came home uh, smoking pot and taking heroin, basically. Uh, and the more recently, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, have, again, a big cause of prescribing opiates, using heroin, marijuana, and so forth. Uh, as a result of their injuries, which are very severe in many cases, as well as the post-traumatic stress syndrome. And then government intervention in general, all sorts of monopoly privileges, creating restrictions in some industries, transferring resources to other industries, and suppressing wages and returns in those industries. Okay, so if you're on the outside uh, of having a, the positive benefits of government intervention and you're on the negative side of that, that means you're an individual who is paying the higher prices to the professionals in the privileged industry and your income is much lower. Okay, so it, it benefits some people, but that means the other people get lower incomes and they have higher prices to pay. The worst off in that second category of people find themselves uh, in a position where they need some kind of release. They need some kind of relief. Uh, they need some kind of escape. And so drugs in general provide that release, uh, that escape from uh, the terrible rigors of being in that kind of position in the economy where you're on the outside paying higher prices and getting lower incomes. And so we find the opioid, um, traditionally we find the opioid addicts uh, coming from those circles of society. The Iron Law of Prohibition. Now I've tagged this PowerPoint presentation onto uh, my old um, presentation on the war on drugs, which I'm not giving this year. So if you want to look at some of the more technical aspects of it, all of my slides are attached to this lecture on the opioid epidemic. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the technical analysis of the Iron Law of Prohibition. Suffice it to say is that when you prohibit something, you make it more potent and more dangerous, and in many cases more addictive. Okay, and what I show in my book, The Economics of Prohibition, is that during alcohol prohibition, the type of alcohol that was produced for the black market was much different than the type of alcohol that was previously produced in the free market or subsequently to the end of alcohol prohibition. So prior to alcohol prohibition in 1920, Americans spent about 50 cents of every dollar on whiskey or whiskeys, you know, vodka, rum, and that sort of thing, and 50 cents on beer and wine. During alcohol prohibition, about 90 to 95 cents out of the dollar went for whiskeys and spirits, things of that nature. And the type of whiskeys that were produced, uh, bathtub gin, for example, were approximately 140 to 160 proof where in the market, it's typically 80 proof. So in the free market, we almost never see that kind of stuff being sold in the stores, except for Saturday morning here in Auburn during the fall football games. <laughs> and why is that the case? Uh, there's only like one brand of this stuff in the ABC stores in town. I said, you ever sell any of that stuff? She goes, no, except for football games. Now, why would that be the case? You can't drink in the stadium. It's prohibited unless you pay $75,000 for one of those skyboxes. <laughs> then for some magical reason, it's okay. So they, they sell, you know, 
that stuff only very rarely and only because of prohibitions. So it's produced in a much more concentrated form um, as enforcement efforts increase. So if you increase the penalties, if you increase the number of law enforcement officials, if you make it easier for law enforcement to find, detect, apprehend, and convict someone for illegal smuggling of this stuff, then what happens is these producers, these smugglers, these dealers will switch from bulky, low-potency drugs to concentrated, high-potency drugs. So what I'm talking about here is, for example, switching from producing, smuggling, and selling marijuana to producing, smuggling, and selling things like cocaine, which is highly concentrated when it's produced. It's highly concentrated when it's produced in its 100, nearly 100% 100 form. Okay, so that any particular container, such as this cover for this thing, if you were smuggling something like this in, and you were smuggling marijuana, you may be able to get in, say, 15,000 single doses. If you were smuggling in cocaine in something this size, you may be able to get in 500, 600,000 individual doses. So it makes more economic sense during prohibition to, especially if they're intensely enforced, to switch your business from something like marijuana to something like cocaine or heroin or crystal meth. And this movement of going from marijuana to cocaine to heroin, it, makes it, al it almost makes the gateway theory seem plausible because Americans have gone from the marijuana, which was big in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, and then in 1984 they really cracked down on marijuana in Florida during the Reagan administration, and marijuana did disappear temporarily from the black market in Florida because the dealers and the smugglers switched from doing marijuana to bringing in cocaine. And things have only gotten worse. Now, legal opiates are the real key here to the epidemic that we've been experiencing in the last few years. Again, it's things like Oxycontin, Vicodin, and others. So if you're prescribed a painkiller, chances are you're not going to need something this strong. Make sure you ask what they're giving you. Make sure you clarify that you don't want an opiate. You want just normal pain meds. Um, and so forth. The reason for the switch is that big pharmaceuticals that produce these drugs um, have been influential in setting new guidelines, the guidelines which now encourage doctors to prescribe opiates um, for minor things. So if you're a fisherman and uh, in Maine and something, you know, you fall off the boat and break your arm, uh, they'll prescribe you opiates. If you're a coal miner and something crashes down on your shoulder and you have a separated shoulder, they're going to give you opiates. Uh, these new guidelines encourage their use by doctors. And basically, the big pharmaceutical companies, there's a committee that's in charge of setting prescription guidelines. And uh, the pharmaceutical companies have been gaining favor with the individuals on this panel. And they do that in a very typical way that they do everything else. They provide grant money to these doctors. They provide travel money to, for them to go to conferences and give their papers, their research findings to other doctors um, and other ways in which uh, the pharmaceutical companies can gain favor uh, with doctors in general, but in this case, uh, a select number of doctors who are in charge of writing and rewriting these prescription guidelines. It's legal what they're doing, but it's unethical in my judgment. Okay, so physicians are encouraged to follow these guidelines. Uh, the DEA oversees the 
prescribing practices of doctors to try to identify people who are just writing, you know, prescriptions for opiates uh, for money. So that they found certain doctors uh, have been prescribing 100 times more of these opiate prescriptions than the average doctor. Uh, and so because the DEA is overlooking this whole process, doctors know that they're being scrutinized, and therefore that encourages them to follow these guidelines even if they don't like it, even if they don't think it's the right thing to do. So that typically painful injuries are now treated with these opiates. So if you break your arm or you separate your shoulder, you're given a 30 or 60 day prescription for these things uh, to take them multiple times a day. Uh, but when the injury heals, when the arm is fixed, when the shoulder is fixed, of course the doctors can't continue writing these prescriptions. So it's, you only get these prescriptions in the short run, typically. And as a result, a certain percentage of these people become addicted. Now, when the original, when the guidelines were announced, um, we found that so far there have been over 250 citations within this uh, area of research to a letter to the editor to the Journal of the American Medical Association. This letter was written by a research assistant who was involved with a study of 40,000 people who went into a hospital and were given, at some point, opioid pain medications. And they found only four out of the 40,000 became addicted. And so this was a one-paragraph letter to the editor written by a non-PhD, non-MD research assistant about the findings they found for short-term, I mean, how long are you going to be in a hospital after all? Two, three, four days, maybe a week, uh, typically. So with medical supervision, short-term, very few people become addicted. But if you're taking opioids three or four times a day for 30 or 60 days, the percentage of people who become addicted apparently is much higher, much higher than one one-hundredth of one percent. So with legal opiates alone, 15,000 people died in 2015. We think the figure is going to be much higher for 2016 and 17. non-legal opiates or illegal opiates. So as we throw thousands and thousands of people through this new pain regime, med pain medicine regime, a certain percentage are going to become addicted. But after 30 days, if you still feel like you need these drugs and you go and want a refill, the doctor's not going to give it to you. That would get the doctor in trouble. So if you've become, if you're one of the people who becomes addicted during the 30 days of your prescription, what are you supposed to do at that point? Go cold turkey? It's dangerous, and it's extremely hard to do. People have actually died from trying to go cold turkey from heroin addiction. You almost need to be under medical supervision to do that kind of thing. So it's not a great option. In other words, could go into an addiction treatment program. The problems with that are many. They're very expensive, not necessarily covered by insurance. Uh, you have to go without your job and your income for 30 days unless your company is going to cover that. And they're not all that successful because typically drug addicts whether legal or illegal, face a lot of problems simultaneously. They have an economic problem. They have a sociological problem. They have family problems. They have psychological problems. It's really hard to cure that whole mess in 30 days of drug treatment. So one option is to go and get black market opiates. You can buy Oxycontin and Vicodin on the black market. So if you find an illegal drug dealer, 
you can buy additional Oxycontins and Vicodins. The problem with this is that sometimes an Oxycontin pill will be $5. Sometimes it will be $25. So very high prices. Um, the supply of these things are uncertain. The market is very thin. And so the market may totally dry up in an area within driving distance for yourself. And as a result, there's uh, price spikes in this market for illegal black market Oxycontin and Vicodin. And so this leads us down this path to black market heroin, which very often is actually cheaper than black market Oxycontin and Vicodin. And you already know a dealer because you've been buying these illegal Oxycontins and Vicodins. So you're already locked into this black market. And as a result, a lot of ordinary people like coal miners and school teachers and fisher people um, find themselves. These are people who would never, ever, ever consider buying black market heroin. People like preachers, people like grocery store owners. So black market heroin. Okay, black market heroin is not commercially or pharmaceutically made. It's made in the black market. That means there's a lot of problems with it. Um, it very often has a lot of impurities, impurities that might make you sick or impurities or substitutes which may kill you. Black market heroin is, has an unknown and highly variable, variable uh, potency. There's black tar uh, heroin, which is very crudely produced, uh, that is, has a relatively, relatively stable potency, but the stuff that mimics the pharmaceutical heroin is a uh, highly variable potency. And that, that's a problem because if you're used to taking a certain amount and then all of a sudden you get something that looks exactly like what you were taking, but is four times more potent, then it can kill you. And uh, it also has unknown fillers, which are used to enhance the potency. And this is where the fentanyl comes in. So a lot of people who are heroin addicts, they're used to the heroin. They know the dose. They know the dealer. All of a sudden, something comes through with fentanyl in it, which is considered by some to be as much as 100 times more potent. Uh, that can also kill you. And we're getting literally tons of fentanyl coming into the country from China now. Okay, black, the black market versions of these products kill, uh, in 2015, 21,000 people. So that's 36,000 people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Solutions. Well, people from the right-wing side of the political spectrum have a recommendation they essentially want to lock these people up for their own good. Of course, that usually doesn't help very much. Uh, people on the left also recommend locking people up. <laughs> okay. Neither one of those approaches really works. Uh, you may, uh, you know, if you put somebody in a prison uh, or a secure treatment facility, you may temporarily break their addiction, but you haven't really solved the problems. All those other sociological, psychological, physiological problems that these people have, economic problems that they have. If you don't solve all of those problems, drug, drug treatment um, very often fails. It fails in, both in the short run and the long run because you haven't really solved the issue. My recommendation is to legalize drugs, to legalize heroin, to legalize cannabis, to allow somebody who comes into a doctor's office and says, I'm addicted to this stuff, I want to get off of it, to allow the doctor to write a prescription for a drug maintenance uh, for, the, for the drug addict uh, in order to give them time 
to figure out their other problems, to get themselves steadied economically, sociologically, psychologically, so that the breaking of the addiction becomes a permanent feature of their being rather than just a temporary fixture. Because if you temporarily solve the problem and the drug addict gets completely clean, and then something happens that makes them want to reintroduce the drug into their body, into their life, like it did with Philip Seymour Hoffman, when family problems and uh, professional problems caused him to want to go out and get some heroin that ultimately killed himself. So if you give uh, maintenance, if you legalize maintenance so that doctors can do that kind of thing, and actually, cannabis is considered by heroin addicts to be one of the best things uh, to help break an addiction because, of course, cannabis relieves pain, it relieves anxiety most of the time, uh, it encourages sleeping and eating, which heroin addicts don't do a lot of, and is important for curing everything. Uh, so if you introduce cannabis into the treatment, I think it, it actually facilitates the cure. Okay, why does that work well? Drug addicts in the black market, they're more or less constantly working and worried about feeding their habit. Okay, so it's it's almost a full-time job uh, to, to get and maintain the money and the drugs necessary to maintain the addiction. So legalization would, would exit that out. Okay, there's no time and worrying about and if you have maintenance. So they can get a job and improve themselves in other areas, and they can solve their problems over the long run. There are a lot of people who are heroin addicts that eventually grow out of their addiction. They become sick and tired of going through that process. So people who are wealthy and can afford their addiction very often maintain their addiction for a number of years and eventually simply grow out of heroin addiction, usually with the help of cannabis. So in conclusion, this is a real and deadly epidemic. Um, it's largely caused by prohibition, the black market, and the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, legalization, I think, would be of great help in reducing these problems. You can look at the decriminalization in Portugal in 2011. It wasn't a big step, as, as big as it sounds, but basically law enforcement cut back on its conviction of dealers. Um, they were all already kind of lenient towards consumers, and um, the prices of these drugs fell. Uh, addicts became more normal citizens, and the sociological problems associated with illegal drug use in Portugal dropped significantly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've only got two minutes for questions, but I'll, I've got office hours this afternoon, and I'll be out there at lunch, too. In the back. What's the position on the concept of prescription? Uh, is that not a prohibition for a monopoly? Conscription? Prescription. The fact that you have to have a prescription. Right. Or that only doctors are allowed to write prescriptions. Well... Most of my relatives are pharmacists, so I'm actually against the doctor's monopoly. I was brought up that way. <laughs> we would materially benefit if pharmacists could write the prescriptions, which they once did. Yes? Uh, I think I'm, uh, and so the Chinese perspective on like, the 45 issue is that uh, the Western world is not hard enough on drug addicts and especially drug dealers. Recently, the Communist Party had a public execution of drug dealers, and it received massive outpour of support from like all, like all, all, everywhere. Kind of the report, like printing it off in the media, saying all the other wonderful things. Because you know, it destroys the uh, incentive and the wish of ever participating in such a uh, immoral and horrendous activity. Yeah, I know. What's your I, response to, to this sort 
of mindset. A lot of people think America, even people inside America don't think government is smart enough on, on drug abuse. Yeah, that's, that's very true. It's, it's a result of ignorance. Uh, they're doing the same thing in the Philippines right now. They do the same thing in Iran and, and other places. Um, and it's a result of ignorance. They think that, like on my one of my original slides, that the supply side is responsible and that somehow you can smash the supply side and that gets rid of the problem. Uh, that's never, ever really worked anywhere um, you, you, because, the, because of the profit motive and the profits in illegal drugs. You can eliminate all the suppliers you want and more people will come in to flood that market. And I think traditionally the Chinese have been um, much more accepting and caring for the addicts themselves. Uh, and they, they want to see everybody being productive and contributing. So they want they want to get those addicts back on their feet. Last one. Uh, my medical friends uh, talking to they confirmed from your issue about there being a supply push from pharmaceuticals and the doctors. But the more significant issue is the demand pull. Yes. Is that now patients are allowed to post on the internet, how do I like my doctor? The doctor is not instantly cough up all of these opioids, you get a bad review and that does all the kind of nasty stuff. So there's a huge demand pull. Yes. And if you legalize these things, that demand pull no longer gets moderated by the doctor. That's right. That's absolutely correct. That's why I put in that unusual slide right up front about the pain epidemic, because Americans are in enormous numbers suffering from chronic pain, which is, in my mind, very poorly understood. Well, I certainly know my doctor friends say it's not so much we have chronic pain, that what, what people claim is chronic pain has shifted over time. It's a cultural change, not a medical one. The pain that you simply used to grab your shoulder and say, ow, I'm going to stoic my way through it, now becomes, I'm uncomfortable, give me drug stop. And that's a cultural shift, not a medical one. I agree with you, uh, 100%. <laughs> it's, there's something phantom about this pain epidemic in my mind. Thank you very much.